we've got a lot to do today. So we'll be reading a lot and we'll be going very fast. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for a beautiful day. We give you the glory. We give you the praise. Once again, Heavenly Father, speak to us, O Lord, by your spirit. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all the saints shall say, Amen. Welcome to SCC. The, 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 the theme for the year is the year of kingdom manifestation. And uh, we are treating the kingdom of God series. And uh, today we are treating the, king, the kingdom view of the tithe, number three. As taught by scripture, not as by tradition. The kingdom view of the tithe. The subtopic is who taught Abraham the principle of the tithe? If the first occurrence of words, expressions, and utterances are generally essential guides to their interpretation and meaning, what can we learn from the first occurrence of the word tithe? Abraham, sorry, Abraham tithed because of who he was. He did not tithe because of what he wanted to become. We did, that last, we did this last week. Now, this has always been the trend in scripture. Abraham tithed, Abraham tithed because of who he was, not because of who he wanted to become or what he wanted to become. Let's look at Jacob and his tithe. Do you remember this, you remember this story? Uh, if you don't remember, when you go home, please read. All right? Now, it says, because we've got, to, we've got a lot to uh, 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 deal with today, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell the story. Please go home and read. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. We know the story, yes? And he was, and he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. Genesis 28, 18. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put at his head, set it up as a, as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. Verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, if the Bible you have is yours, underline this. He says, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I am going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. Listen to this. And this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. Listen, listen. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Jacob did not say, I will give a tenth so you make my way prosperous. He said, if you make my way prosperous and I come back in peace, then I will give a tenth. Are you getting me? And, and, and that is the kingdom view of the tithe. Because tradition will say to you, if you want to be blessed, then give the tithe. But Jacob says, if you bless me, then I will give the tithe. If you make my way prosperous, then he says, I will surely give a tenth. Of everything that you gave me. This has also been in your Bible all along. Ago. Why did he vow to give a tenth? He did not vow to give a tenth because it was fanciful. <laughs> he vowed to give a tenth because of his knowledge of what a tenth represents. The Israelites, listen to what Moses said to the Israelites. Deuteronomy 12, 8. 
you shall not at you shall not at all do as we are doing here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. Verse 9. For as yet you have not come to the rest. And the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. Did you get that? You have not yet come to the rest. And the inheritance which the Lord your God is giving you. Listen to verse 10. But when you cross over Jordan, Jordan means a low estate. <laughs> oh. He says, when you cross, when you are, when you leave your, your low estate, when you cross over the Jordan, which is your low estate, and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit. And he gives you rest from all your enemies round about. So that you dwell in safety. Then, there will be the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. There, you shall bring all that I command you. Your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, and your what? When were they supposed to bring it? When they have crossed over their low estate. When they are no longer... <laughs> are you getting what I'm saying? And when they dwell in the land which the Lord is giving them to inherit. And, and when they have been given rest from all around... When they don't have to fight enemies anymore. When they dwell in safety. That is the time they were commanded to bring their tithe. Does that make sense? They were told to bring the tithe after they had crossed over their low estate. And were dwelling in safety. Because of what the tenth or the tithe represents. Why did Abraham give a tenth? I believe Abraham gave a tenth because of what he knew it represents. Am I going too fast? Okay. How did he know of the principle of the tithe? According to biblical chronology, Abraham was the first to be associated with the giving of the tithe. It is therefore proper to ask how and when he must have come to know of the principle. Is that, is, is that okay? I believe Abraham learned the principle of the tithe or the tenth when he met with Melchizedek. Like I'm saying today, we're going to do a lot of reading. <laughs> And I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because of this word, to meet. Last week we saw it, to meet is kira. It means to have an encounter with someone from the opposite direction. Now, this may be an intentional or a hostile meeting. Listen to this. Such meetings were not just for a handshake, but for the giving of information. Do you get that? Now, if you look at Genesis 14, where he says Ab Abraham gave a tenth when he met Melchizedek, it is not stated there that Melchizedek taught him. But if after his meeting, Abraham gave a tenth, then something must have, something must have gone on there. But it is not stated there. So as, as a teacher, it is only good that I explain further why I'm saying that Abraham and Melchizedek's meeting was not only just for a handshake. It was not just, oh, Melchi, <laughs> how are you, Melchi? <laughs> and then Melchi says, hey, Abraham, how are you, Abraham? Goodbye. It wasn't Melchi, Abraham, goodbye. 
Do you understand? So let's find out whether my conclusion that the meeting with Abraham and Melchizedek was not just for a handshake, but it was the giving of information. Yes? Genesis 15.10. So what, let's look at places where the word meet, kira, is used in Hebrew. This is the second time the word is used in Hebrew. Genesis 15.10. Then he brought, this was when uh, God was going to cut covenant with Abraham. Yes? And he said to him he should bring uh, a, a few things. So he cut a covenant with him. Now listen. Then he brought all, the, all these to him and cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite. Opposite. This is where my definition of people coming from opposite direction, yes? This is where it starts. Opposite. So Abraham cut the animals into two and he put them this way, opposite each other. The word opposite there is kira. <laughs> opposite. To meet. The second thing we want to look at where kira is used is this. Genesis 18, 2. So he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, three men. Listen, I'm, I'm building. I'm building. A, I'm, I, I, we, <laughs> we, are, we are going somewhere. Yes. So please follow slowly. Yes. <laughs> so he lifted his eyes and looked and behold three men were standing by him and when he saw them what did he do he ran from the tent door to what from opposite directions yes to meet them and bowed before him uh, be before, before him. Now, verse 3. And he said, my Lord, if I have now found favor in your sight, do not pass on by your servant. Verse 4. Please, let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Now, meeting, oh, the meeting. The meeting was not just a handshake and then goodbye. Yes? Verse 5. And I will bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh your heart. After, after that, you may pass by, inasmuch as you have come to your servant. They said, do as you have said. Do we know this story? Okay, we know this story, so let's, let's go on. Then verse 8, so he took butter and milk and the calf which he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree as they ate. But what did they do? The Bible says they met. Now, the meeting was not only for a handshake and then goodbye, but there was some fellowship. Yes? There was some fellowship. Now, listen to this. Verse 9. Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? So he said, Here in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. This was part of the meeting. And Abraham said to, uh, and, 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 and Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I had grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being also old? Verse 13, And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I am old? 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have. A son. This was a meeting. The meeting was not only for a handshake. The meeting was for fellowship and for the passing on of an information. Yes? Yes? Good. I, I just want to make sure that we know that 
Every time there is a kira, every time there is a meeting, a kira, it is not for a handshake. It is for the it is for an information. Okay? Now let's look at Lot. Genesis 19:1. Now the two we are talking about tithe. <laughs> now the two angels came to Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he did what? He rose to meet them. He rose to kira them. And he bowed himself with his face towards the ground. And he said, Hear now, my lords. Please turn in to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise early and go on your way. And they said, No, but we will spend the night in the open square. But he insisted strongly. So they turned in to him and entered his house. Then he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread. And they ate. <laughs> you see the meeting? Yeah? Then the man said to Lord, Have you anyone else here, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place. What was happening? There was the, there was information that was being given. Good. Verse 13, for we will destroy this place because the outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The meeting was not only for a handshake, but there was an impartation of knowledge. They had to know something. Isaac, Rebecca, and Abraham's son. We know this story too. I'm, I'm, I'm only, I'm only, I only want to re-emphasize the fact that when there is a kira, there is always a time for fellowship. And there is the impartation of information. All right? Um, Isaac, Rebecca, and uh, Abraham's servants. Genesis 24, 65. And she said, sorry, and she had said to the servant, who is this man walking? That was when uh, 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 um, Rebecca was uh, being sent to Isaac. So uh, Rebecca was uh, on the... Uh, on the horse, <laughs> Eliezer was also walking with them. And then afar off, they saw someone coming. So Rebecca asked, uh, um, he asked Eliezer, who is this person that we see in front of us? In front of us, yes? Who is this man walking in the field to what? To meet us, to kira us. The servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. Now listen to what happened. They met, yes? And the servant told Isaac, what? All the things that had happened. That was not just a handshake. Oh, uh, Isaac, well, I've, I, had, I had a very difficult journey. I've brought your wife. Goodbye. And he was gone. No, that did not happen. The Bible says he told him everything that happened. So every kira, there is an information given. Jason, are we, are we getting it? Good. Then Jacob and Laban. Genesis 29, 13. Then it came to pass when Laban heard the report about Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to what? To meet Kira, he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. So he, Jacob, told Laban some things. What? <laughs> so that wasn't, oh, he met him, brought him to the house, and then... Uh, 
it's late, so let's all go to bed. No. The Bible says he told him all the things. Yes? Am I reading too much? Okay. It is only to give you that confidence that every kira has uh, more than a handshake. The meeting between Abram and the king of Sodom was not only for a handshake. That is the, we read this last week. Yes? Okay. So was the meeting between Abram and the king of Salem. It was also not for a handshake. We read this last week. The meeting between Peter and Cornelius was not for a handshake. And Pete, and so as Peter was coming, that's Acts 10, 25. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius did what? Met him. This one is a Greek word, sinantau. And fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter opened his mouth and said, that is from 34. In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. We know that the meeting in Cornelius' house wasn't just, oh, uh, uh, just for a handshake, and then that was it. Yes? Yes? We all know that. Okay. Because of time, we've just read this bit. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, of the truth, uh, uh, I perceive that God shows no partiality. So if we agree that Melchizedek and Abraham's meeting was more than a handshake, we will therefore not be wrong to suggest that the meeting, sorry, that he must have heard of the principle of the tithe from Melchizedek. Is that, is that, a, is that a proper conclusion? Yes? Since that was what he, Abraham, did after the meeting. So why, this is, this is where the meat is coming in. So why was a tenth or a tithe? Why? When Abraham met Melchizedek, why didn't, why didn't Melchizedek say, oh, you can give one percent. Oh, you can give two percent. Look, even if you like, you can give 20. Just like we hear people say today, they say, oh, because we, we, we will come to a place where that would make sense. Oh, we are under grace. We are not under law. So some people say they give 50%. Some say they give 60%. Some say they give because they are under law. Sorry? First fruits. Do you get me? Why a tenth? A tenth represents your all in acknowledgement of the truth that <laughs> you are only a recipient of everything you own. Do you understand that? Junior Rosemond, do you understand that? You do. You young ones, you are blessed, you know. Because some of us, we have to unlearn the poison first. We have to unlearn the poison in order to make room for the truth. And you are getting it at this age. You are blessed. <laughs> Amen. Good. What is the significance of the number 10? We shall only look at the first part. 10 represents all. We know that, don't we? We shall only dwell on this. All right? 10 represents completeness of an order. And 10 represents a new beginning. We have dealt with this. But we want to dwell only on 10 representing all. The reason why... Abraham gave a tenth 
was because of his knowledge of what a tenth represents. Yes? Good. Are we, are we getting it? Good. Exodus 3, 19. And I know, this is God speaking, and I know that a king of Egypt will not let you go unless forced to do so. No, not by a mighty hand. This is God saying this to Moses. And then verse 20 says, And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with some of my wonders. Sorry? How many? How many? And what is the definition of all? Again? What does all mean? All means all, yes? Nothing left, yes? All. Okay, he says he will smite Egypt with all. This is God. This is God. This is God. Yeah? God. The almighty God. Almighty. Yeah? He says, I will smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. How many wonders did God use to smite Egypt, to represent his all? How many? Why ten? If God is almighty, why couldn't he use just one? Huh? God is almighty. God is all powerful. So God could have used just one plague. But he says, I will smite Egypt with all my wonders. And he used ten plagues. God did not use ten plagues because he was powerless. He used ten plagues because ten represents his all. Let's look at the ransom for life or a redemption money. Listen to this. When you go home, read Exodus 30. Yes? When you have, sorry, when you take a census of the Israelites to count them, listen to this, each one must pay, must pay the Lord a ransom for his life. Say a ransom for his life. Again, again, he says, when you take census of the Israelites to count them, each one must pay the Lord a ransom for his life. At the time he is counted, then no plague will come on him when you number them. This has been in your Bible all along. Verse 13, each one who crosses over to those already counted is to give what? A half shekel according to the sanctuary shekel which weighs 20 geras. This half shekel is an offering to the Lord. Verse 15, listen, the rich are not to give more than a half shekel and the poor are not to give less when you make an offering to the Lord to atone for their lives. He says, <laughs> when it comes to the ransom for their lives, the rich are not to give more than half a shekel and the poor are not supposed to give less than half a shekel. When it comes to what? A ransom for their life. A redemption money. Why were the rich not to give more than half a shekel? Jonathan, are we getting it? <laughs> Why were the rich not to give more than half a shekel and the poor not to give less than half a shekel? You will now understand why those who say, because we are under grace, so I will give more than uh, 10%, they don't know what they are talking about. They have no idea. They think that scripture uses numbers carelessly. It is a ten for a purpose. Sometimes I get angry, you know, 
when, when I want to deal with some religious demons. Why were the rich not to give more than half a shekel and the poor not, uh, 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 not to give less than half a shekel? It is because of what half a shekel represents. What is half a shekel? Numbers 3 verse 47. A shekel is 10 geras. If a shekel is 10 geras, half a shekel is what? So, sorry, if a shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel is what? Are you getting it? Or I, I, I should explain further. God says, when you count the Israelites, so they do not have a plague among them, they are supposed to pay a redemption money. The redemption money for either rich or poor should be half a shekel. And now we are being told, he says, the rich should not give more than that. And the poor should not give less than that. Why? It is because half a shekel is ten geras, And ten represents all. Are you getting me? <laughs> Therefore, half a shekel is ten geras. Why ten geras? Or half a shekel? Because Jesus, who is the full payment of our lives, is all of God for us. I'm not sure you, I'm not sure you, you, you've got it. <laughs> I'm not sure you've got it. To give more than half a shekel, you are saying that you need more than Jesus. Thank you, sir. That is why he says the poor would not, should not give less and the rich should not give more because Jesus is enough. Jesus is all of God. You see how it ties in? Jesus is all. Come on, let's say, it. Jesus is all. Again. Again. Jopaf, <laughs> you are quiet today. It's because we are speeding, eh? <laughs> okay, now let's look at the manna or the bread of life. Listen to this. Listen to this. We'll be finishing soon, yes? Listen to this. Exodus 16, verse 15. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. Verse 16. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need. <laughs> let's say it again. <laughs> let, again, let's, let's say it. Let every man gather it according to Again, let we are, we are still talking about tithing, you know. I hope you've not forgotten. But you see, if you come to understand, no one would pressure you. No one would coax you. No one would put fear in you. We are not supposed to, we are not supposed to teach this with fear in the first place. Because you are a kingdom person. You don't give because you want to be blessed. You give because you are blessed. Let every man gather it according to his own, his, his, um, according to each one's needs. One omer, let's say one omer, 
for each person. According to the number of persons, let every man take for those who are in his tent. Verse 17, then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. Let's look at verse 18. So when they measured it by Omer, he who gathered much had nothing left over. And he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. Verse 19, and Moses said, let no man leave any of it till morning. Verse 20, the stiff nakedness of the Israelites. Listen, notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses, but some of them left part of it until morning. And it bred worms and stank. The instruction was, one Omer each. And the houses that had more people, they gathered more. And the houses that had less, they gathered less. And the Bible says, those who gathered more had nothing left over. And those who gathered less did not lack. And Moses says, Listen, do not leave anything overnight. What happened? Some of them, why? They, why do you think, why do you think they did that? Come on. Why do you think they did not take Moses' advice? Why did they think that not leaving some overnight would do. They thought they would have some lack. They thought, they thought, oh, that's right, security. They wanted to make sure that, hey, listen, uh, if what Moses said, <laughs> if, if it doesn't happen, at least I have something to, I have something to live on. Banker. But listen to this. Why an Omer? You will come to understand. Why was it that those who gathered much had nothing left over and those who, the, those who gathered little had no lack? Why did the leftovers go bad? <laughs> it is because of what an Omer represents. When God said it should be an omer, he knew what he was talking about. When Moses said, don't leave any overnight, he knew what he was talking about. But those who did not know, they did whatever they wanted. It was because of what an omer represents. You know what an Omer is? You know what an Omer is? Exodus 16, 36 says what? What is an Omer? That was the reason. So when God said, to Moses, tell them to take only an omer each. God was saying, let them take all that is sufficient for the day. Hey! And those who hold it, it, it went bad because all that you need for the day has been given to you. An omer of manna represented all of God 
to the Israelites. So is Jesus Christ the bread of life. Hi. So is Jesus the bread of life. He is all of God for us. Do you understand that? Is it only me that is having some, 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 something happening to, is it only me? Is it only me? When God gave them an omer each, it represented Christ Jesus. That was the reason why anyone who took more than that did not last for the day. Because you are trying to say to God that you, come in again, Uncle Chrissy, you need more than Jesus. You know, come on, tell me, do you need more than Jesus? So you now understand why I say those people who say, because we are under grace, therefore, oh, as for me, I will give 20%. As for me, oh, uh, 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 you don't know what you are talking about. God says, half a shekel. The rich guy can give more than half a shekel. But he says, he's not to give more than that. The poor guy, he says, you're not supposed to give less than that. Because of what the shekel represents. It represents God's all. If you don't give 10%, you don't know what you are talking about. <sighs> to give, so the giving of a tenth or a tithe, therefore, is an acknowledgement of the truth that it is God that gives you the ability to produce wealth. This was what Melchizedek taught Abraham. So when he gave him a tithe of all, he was acknowledging the truth that his victories were gained by the power of God alone. The giving of his tithe represented total surrender of his all. This is the truth scripture teaches. Stay blessed.